Welcome to the Roy Rogers and Dale Evans Museum. This place is a stroll through our lives together. You know, I never could throw anything away, so we built the museum instead. <laughs> that was back in 1967. We've made some changes since then, but the photographs and cowboy boots and parade cars. Don't forget Trigger. Of course, Trigger. And buttermilk. They're all here to bring back memories to you or show you little ones about the life of a cowboy. And cowgirl. That's right, Roy. We're so glad you came. Happy, Happy trails to you till we meet again. Run across your silver screens for over fifty years. He's brought bad men to justice. He's seen laughter and he's seen tears. And I know forever in many hearts he'll reign as the king of the cowboys. Dad had a tremendous influence on us. He not only was big on the screen, but also big in life to us. So he was almost bigger than life dad. How do you take him? Do you take him as the guy who, you know, shares milk with you in the morning and has a couple of eggs? Or do you look at him in a sense that, here's a guy that 25 million other kids scream and holler and run down to the rail and want to touch him? He's a kind and gentle legend. A hero is his fame, showing young folks to see the right from wrong, and he's taught me very safe. And I know forever, in many hearts he'll reign as the king of the cowboys. There is magic in his name. I think they tried to give back as much as they could, both of them. The hospitals and the orphanages they visited, and um, it really moved my dad to tears a lot of times. They're real. They're not phony at all. They care about what they've done. They care about us. They care about a lot of kids in this world. Saddled up on his golden palomino with a six-gun by each side. In his boots and spurs and his white hat Rides a man with a lot of pride And I know forever In many hearts he'll reign As the king of the cowboys There is honor to his name He's a little kid at heart and I think that's why little kids really identified with him. Dad was always so natural. There was nothing phony about him. He acted the way he lived. I mean, you know, he wasn't any different on the screen than he was when he was home with the family. And then, of course, they stood for the American family values. And I think that came across in everything they said and everything they did and the family we had. In a western sky of blue, he has given us precious memories and happy trails for me and you. Roy was just so much like my brother and my family, Texas, I mean, country people, you know what I'm saying? So much like oh, them. shucks. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Why do you think you might be able to help me? Well, how'd you ever get yourself in a mess like that? Never mind how I got here. How do I get off? Please help me off this thing. I can't swim. It's sinking. Sure can. You know, we worked together a long, long time. 
26 pictures. That's a lot of, a lot of association. And I knew his foibles and he knew mine. Oh, what do you think you're doing? Could forget. I ask you to help, not front me, of all the stupid, idiotic things I ever heard of in my life. Then I met a girl named Mary. He was here just a minute ago. Uh, who was? That young fellow who pulled me out of the lake, Gabby. You know what I'm talking about. Where did he come from? Well, I don't know where he came from. I was out there in the buckboard, drowning, and I was calling for you, and I looked up, and here he was. Handsome young fella? Well, yeah. Say, you're, you're not Roy Rogers. That's right, ma'am. Oh, gee, I think you're wonderful, uh, Mr. Rogers. I see all your pictures. Roy Rogers, eh? Hey? Dad! Forget. Oh, it's you again. Say, hey, you don't happen to know a rhyme for Saskatoon, do you? What I really admired about him was his love for children. And, and he would tell me about when he went on tour about going to the hospitals where the sick children were, taking Trigger in there, you know? And that's the first thing he did when he got to a city. And I admired that because I had a son. Handsome young fella riding a beautiful horse, shows up out of nowhere, saves your life, and then just plumb disappears. Glory, you dreamed it. I always wanted a big family with lots of children, always did. And he loved old people. He was a knight wearing armor, anything you say. He was so good to, I'm not, what is it to call them now, Sen seasoned citizens <laughs> instead of senior citizens, seasoned citizens. So, so I always- Don't go too far on that senior citizen <laughs> stuff. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I because we are well seasoned. <laughs> we are well seasoned, both of us. but. <laughs> Uh, we had a camaraderie, really. Oh, I've got a million dreams and a Stetson full of schemes, so my future's always bright and gay. We were in Chicago at the stadium. We were on horseback, both of us. We were announced, but right before we were announced to go in and do our show at the Chicago Stadium, Roy said, what are you doing New Year's Eve? And I said, I don't know. I said, I, I don't have any plans. He said, why don't we get married? Though I'm not a millionaire, still I've happiness to spare. I've been saving for a rainy day. I don't know how I raked up enough nerve to ask her, but I, I, I was getting ready to go into the arena, so I don't have to hang, hang around and take the back talk. So. I asked her about it and it took off and got in the room. I worry about the weather as long as we're together. We can always see it through. And I said, well, let me think about it. And when we were through, he said, have you thought about it? And I said, the answer is yes. I'll take a chance. Let it rain helter-skelter. There's a shelter in view. I worry about the weather as long as we're together. We can always see it through. Before I married Roy, I suddenly got frightened about what I was going to do, and I wasn't really sure that I could bring it off with the three children. And uh, I went into the closet and I prayed. And I promised God that if he would help me in this marriage, that there would never, never be a divorce under any circumstances because I wanted to be a mother to these children. People gave us six months. We'll give them six months. And they would have been right if I hadn't have gone to God. <laughs> Mom insisted that we all be there for dinner. And uh, we would sit around the big round table that's in the museum. And uh, the food would be spun on a lazy Susan in the middle. And we'd all try to take our turns, but sometimes we wouldn't be through dipping up and somebody else would turn it. And it was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a zoo. 
It really was, you know, and all of us brought home our friends. Dad would go out in the backyard at night in time for dinner, and he said, if your mind come in, if you're not, go home. I'm up in the morning before daylight, and before I sleep, the moon shines bright. And I'd come home, and it would be dark when we finished work. It was desperately hard for me with all of those adopted children, a big family. It's bacon and beans most every day. I just as soon be prairie hay. We were told we were adopted since we were little. We couldn't even pronounce it, adopted. Well, you know, you're chosen. Okay, you know. So as we grew up and knew what the word was, it still didn't mean anything because we were all part of one family. When they began adopting the other children, they set us all down and told us, hey, everybody in this family is gonna be equal. Whether you're adopted or whether you're natural, everybody's equal, so get that through your heads and stick to it. One time, it's before Roy and I were, were ever together. And Cheryl and Linda were talking, and Linda got mad at Cheryl and said, well, I'm the only daughter. said, I'm their daughter. You're just adopted. And Cheryl looked at him. She said, I was chosen. They had to take you. <laughs> Sandy had a real deep voice. And he would rock back in his chair, and he would expound, you know, like, talk pontificate. She say. told him, Sandy, you better be quiet. I'm, I've just about had enough with you. And he just kept it up and kept it up. Finally, she reached over and we, we had our own cows. So we had a pitcher of milk on the table, just a metal pitcher. And she dumped it over and it was just dripping off his eyelashes and off his hair. And he goes, Mom! <laughs> you know? And the milk's just dripping off of him everywhere. But it, we, we all thought it was funny, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, did they tell you about the time we were in uh, Ohio, at the Ohio State Fair in this very swank hotel? We're having dinner, and I told the kids, I said, now listen to me. I don't want to hear any, any arguing or funny antics at the table because this is a nice, dignified place. I want nothing. So we, I sat between the boys because Sandy had a bad habit of going <laughs> at Dusty, making a face at him. So we're sitting there at the table, and, and Sandy went, at Dusty. <laughs> and, and, and Dusty started to do something. I was between the two of them, so I just, I just pinched both of their legs real hard. I went, <laughs> like that. And Sandy went, ow! <laughs> Lana would never harm any of us kids. And one time, Dusty got the hammer out, and he was standing there pounding on Lana's toes. <laughs> And my mom said, I want you to know what that feels like, Dusty. So she made him take off his shoes, and she pounded on his toes with a hammer, and he was dancing a jig all over the place. He said, I won't do that again, Mom, ever. So we learned a lot of lessons from being taught, you know, you don't do that because this is how it feels. The bird with feathers of blue is waiting for you back in your own. You'll have the world at your feet, a haven complete. We didn't want them to be any different or show people's children. We wanted them to be regular kids. And we tried not to spoil our children, but we tried to make them happy and give them things that we thought would be good for them. Weary at heart, back where you started from. We went to church every Sunday. I, we insisted that they be in Sunday school every Sunday and church with us. We always lived within walking distance of school, and so every morning Sandy and I would take off and go to walk to school. So Sandy and I would walk along, and, uh, and we got bored. We got to thinking, we, we saw the mailman come down the street and put all the mail in the boxes, and we thought, wouldn't it be funny if Mr. Johnson got Mr. Smith's mail and Mr. Smith got Mr. Johnson's mail? Yeah, let's try that. So we, we went down and was gathering up mail and just indiscriminately putting it in different boxes. And uh, we're, we switched about four or five mailboxes and we're zippity doo -dah on down the road, not paying any attention. And mom comes out to the end of the drive in the Dodge and she stopped and she's watching us do this. About the fifth mailbox, we hear the engine rev up and, and mom burns out the driveway, up the street. She doesn't even get to us and she's got the brakes on, slammed on the brake, and the door's open. She's dressed in her 
cowgirl outfit and her boots on, and she's chasing us down the street. Come on and throw away your troubles, cast them to the moon, and sell all your worries for free. Cause there's a great day coming, can't you hear them all humming? It's a cowboy jubilee. I always felt that these kids were, they're part of me, you know, because if it wasn't for those children, I wouldn't be here, you know. If they didn't speak their piece and they didn't show that they liked you, why, uh, there wouldn't be a Roy Rogers. In Life Magazine's recent survey of children's heroes, Roy was the only Hollywood celebrity in the top ten, ranking with Lincoln, Roosevelt, MacArthur, and Babe Ruth. I had a responsibility to my audience, and I tried to respect that. Sometimes you'll see one of these pictures open up, and it'll be the first five minutes of the picture. They've killed 150 people yeah. just in all directions, just shooting. Well, that, that's not necessary, but little kids, that, have, that could really affect them one the wrong way. It seems to me we could center down uh, on some good things that make you feel well and that make you want to do good, you know? If you know anything, anything at all, don't be afraid to tell me. I will. I want to tell the truth. Sure you do. If everybody would tell the truth, this would be a much better world to live in. Come on in, friends, and help us celebrate belonging to the greatest country in the whole world. We believe in doing everything possible to show our love for America, and that includes respecting our flag. She's a proud, beautiful symbol. One sure way to protect our country is to follow its laws. That's right. A country is mainly the people who live in it, and the laws are the rules to live by. So respect those laws and love that flag. You know, boys and girls, the real purpose of the Writers Club is for all of us to get together and become better acquainted. Help each other. Especially help prevent any and all kinds of accidents. Do that for me, will you? You know, the best Roy Rogers writers are the ones who live up to the rules on the back of your membership card. I've always been afraid of horses. There are all kinds of horses, same as there are people. You make friends with him in no time. I'd be too scared. <laughs> May the good Lord take a liking to you. Take a liking May to he you. spread his blessings on your trail. On your May trail. he be your guide anywhere you ride. And be always your host when you need him most. May the good Lord take a liking to you. Take a liking May your prayers for comfort never fail. Never, never fail. And if someday you make a dream come true with the making you nothing to do. It's cause the good Lord has taken a liking to you. When we'd play Madison Square Garden, we'd get a call from the hospital. Could they bring such and such kids? Could they be handled? And we'd handle them some way, you know. Carry, we'd get guys to carry them and put them in seats. You know, the little guys, some of them couldn't even raise their arms to clap, but you could see it in their face, you know. They, it makes it feel like you've done something worthwhile. The smile and their little arms, they put their arms up and put their arms around you, you feel like you're in heaven. It's really, it's really nice. When the night seems to cover all From the hills you see them shining See the lights of old Santa Fe They have really tried to live their lives as though tomorrow was their last day. And that's pretty much, you know, how they taught us kids. They're not only highly revered by the public, they're highly revered by all of us. And it's just great to be in their presence. There's an aura that's hard to describe at the Apple Valley House. All these different things, these different cultures, these different backgrounds, people, it's all comes down to love. And there's a chance I'll be in clover if a certain miss is waiting there for me. Well, we'll see. There I'll stay. Never more to roam. Just a shadow but we'll call it home. And we'll find our silver lining in the lights of old Santa Fe. 
he had some trouble with his heart. He had spangina pains and and I got to thinking, you know, this man could have a heart attack on me. It really ate on me for two or three months. I thought, wow, you know. Um, and I said, and I've never really, I'd never really told him how much he meant to me. I didn't come to him and say, Dad, you know, I love you and you have made a difference in my life and I appreciate you as a person. And I, and I have never told him that. So I told Mom, I said, you know, Mom, I'm really afraid that something might happen to Dad. And she says, well, Dusty, it's real, could happen. I said, well, I need to talk to him. She says, well, he needs to talk to you too. And I said, then why doesn't he? And she says, well, why don't you? So I called him, I said, hey, Dad, what are you up to today? Mind if I go with you? No. Come on, let's go. It's okay. So we got in a truck and we do the same thing we did, you know, the him in the hall and then I'm going through the, you know, opening the glove box and playing with all the garbage in the glove box, not I'm trying to do everything but say what I was there to say. And so finally I just kind of got my heart out of my throat and I said, Dad, you know, I said, you know I love you. And he and it just it was kinda of like a dead silence there. And he says, What? I said, do you know I love you? He said, well, I love you too, son. I said, no, Dad. I mean, I really love and appreciate you and what you've meant to me, and I'm afraid you're going to die before I get to say that. Whew, boy, the brakes went on. It was over to the side of the road, and we kind of got out and hugged each other. And it just, it, that wall that we had built over the years, over stupid little things, just came down. We finally broke the wedge between that mountain that father and sons build, and now we're friends. And so every day I see him now. I mean, every day since that day, I see him. I, I hug him and say, hi, Dad, I love you. How you doing? And I mean, and I'm not, it doesn't catch in my throat anymore. I hug him and hold him, you know, or come up and tap him on the back every time I see him, because tomorrow I might not see him. He's the king of the cowboys, a legend in his time. say why why do you think that Roy was so popular I always say when I, I look at Roy I think of Peter Pan always young he has a young spirit I've always been crazy about kids anyway and I uh, to, to get a chance to entertain them and make them feel good it made me feel happier all over <laughs> 